I'm Ben, short for Benjamin Timothy Haggard. Shannon and I got married seven years ago, but things haven't been going well lately. Despite my efforts, I can't shake the feeling of dissatisfaction with how our relationship has developed. This feeling has stuck with me for about six weeks, even before an unexpected photo appeared. The tension between Shannon and me has been increasing, especially in the last few days, and I suspect her sister Nita is somehow involved. After I received the photo, I found myself working outside the city on a more challenging project than usual. There was a critical issue with the main refrigeration unit at Purdue University, and despite our efforts, the team couldn't solve it. As an employee of the reputable Fraser HVAC company, I'm one of two highly qualified engineers responsible for solving such emergencies. Luckily, it was my turn to be on duty that week. So on Tuesday, I went on a four-hour trip to West Lafayette and stayed there until Thursday. We finally solved the problem around nine o'clock in the evening. Exhausted, I decided to have dinner at the nearest place on the university grounds, and by around 10 p.m., I went to my hotel room. I quickly sent Shannon a message saying I was going to bed and we'd continue testing the system the next morning. I also mentioned we'd meet for dinner on Friday. After a refreshing shower, I got ready for bed with ESPN playing in the background. Unexpectedly, I received a message from Roland Bruton, my closest colleague at Fraser. The message included an apology and a photo taken that evening at Casa Dell. Roland asked me to call him if I wanted to discuss this further. The attached photo showed a couple sitting at a table in a cozy restaurant, leaning against each other with intertwined hands and locked gazes. It was Shannon, my beloved wife, and standing next to her was Eric Chesterton, a colleague from the OSU library. I've never treated Eric warmly, considering him a bit strange, but the idea that he might be connected to my wife never crossed my mind. Recently, our relationship had been strained, and the thought of Shannon betraying me with another man was unimaginable. Realizing that doing nothing would only fuel my growing anger, I decided to turn off the TV and contact Roland. I conveyed my apologies for disturbing his Thursday night, pausing to grasp the situation. I explained to Roland that it was time to discuss what he had seen. I shared that Emily and I had an early dinner, and as we finished, we noticed them on the other side of the restaurant. Emily had spotted Shannon and asked if it was her. I was intrigued, so I observed them for a while taking pictures. Fortunately, they didn't engage in any affectionate gestures like kissing. They seemed deeply engrossed in conversation, mirroring the scene in the photograph. There was a hint of regret in Roland's voice as he exhaled loudly. He conveyed to me that he sincerely apologized. I inquired about their departure, asking if they left together and where they were headed. Reflecting on the incident, Roland continued by saying they waited in their car in the parking lot for a short while, but Shannon and the other man never appeared. Eventually, they decided to leave and sent me a photo. Roland expressed regret for leaving in a hurry without waiting for them, explaining that it seemed they had just received their drinks and hadn't started eating, suggesting a significant wait. A heavy silence followed, leaving both of us perplexed, unsure of what to say. Eventually, Roland spoke, expressing his understanding. He conveyed that he now understood the situation, and went on to share. I get it now. My friend Emily wanted me to send you her warm regards. She's upset with Shannon, and I share her feelings, though it hasn't fully hit me yet. I'm sure I'll be furious in a few hours. I inquired about the Purdue job, asking when I could come home. Roland provided the information, stating, Yes, we plan to test it tomorrow morning, and after that, I'll make a four-hour trip back. It'll give me time to calm down and remind myself not to act impulsively. I responded with a smile. Deep down, Roland was aware that I wouldn't resort to violence against Shannon, and he understood that perfectly. Roland mentioned that he and his friend Emily had been discussing something, but it was probably too early to bring up. He offered, If you ever need a place to stay overnight, we have a guest room just for you. I conveyed my gratitude, expressing, Thank you, Roland. I really appreciate it. I don't know my next steps yet, but I'll definitely consider your offer. After a few more minutes of quiet conversation, I ended the chat. I turned off the light, lay down, and quickly fell asleep. After all, no marriage is perfect, right? Despite our flaws, I genuinely loved Shannon and did everything I could to make her happy for seven years, including three years of dating. Of the four who married, we faced constant issues. From my observations, the main problems were money and closeness. 
Luckily, we didn't encounter problems in these areas. Neither of us was a wasteful spender, and our private connection remained as crucial to both of us as in the early months of our relationship. Though things became more routine, Shannon and I still desired each other equally. No, for us, the problem didn't relate to finances or closeness, but with Nita. She was 35, about four years older than Shannon and me. Her husband, Alex, wasn't any better. He was a vain lawyer who saw himself as superior, but at least I didn't have to endure his presence so often. Shannon always looked up to her older sister Nita, a frequent guest in our house, who constantly gave unsolicited advice on how we should live. Shannon suggested that it would make more sense to store the dishes in one place and move the spices elsewhere. She commented on whether I still used a gas grill, stating that charcoal enhances the taste of meat much better. She also expressed her opinion on the hideous green chair, describing it as screaming trailer park in general. That conveyed her overall perspective on the matter. It deeply bothered me that Shannon couldn't resist and ask her to leave. The most unpleasant part, sparing you the detailed list of Nita's other offenses, was that she consistently belittled me behind my back. If I was in the room, she'd be overly kind, endlessly praising me for being nice to Shannon, for being caring, for being so helpful around the house, while poor Alex, according to her, couldn't even change a light bulb. Overhearing her speak negatively about me more than once when she thought I wasn't around, one day, while Shannon and she were having coffee in the kitchen, I quietly entered through the back door after a jog. She conveyed to Shannon that she adored her, but had to admit that I, Ben, could be a bit uncouth. She expressed that I didn't have the same charm as Christopher or even Tom, and despite my higher education, she questioned why I worked with my hands. In her opinion, Shannon could have chosen someone much better. I couldn't understand her thinking, especially considering we had been married for almost two years by then. It was frustrating to hear Nita reminiscing about Shannon's past boyfriends. She later asked if I was seriously thinking about having children with him, sounding upset. Just five minutes later, she appeared in front of me with a smile and mentioned that Shannon and she were just talking about what a wonderful husband she has. I couldn't believe it. Shannon and I had argued about this many times, and though she had calmed me down, she never took any action to solve the problem. She mentioned that Nita wasn't that bad and actually liked me, but I waved her words away. I expressed my emotions, exclaiming how I couldn't stand it when Nita said we were definitely not going to have children. Overwhelmed with emotions, I paced back and forth in the bedroom, consumed by anger. Disappointment overwhelmed me, and I feared I was on the verge of losing my mind. My wife tried to calm me down, explaining she was venting her discontent and loved me despite her tendency to incite quarrels. But this quarrel was one of the worst in our lives. I couldn't contain my emotions and ended up saying a few rude words, after which I ran out of the house. I was gone for six long hours, seeking solace with my friend Raphael, the bartender at Bob's restaurant. Mostly, I just sat there trying to clear my head. When I got home at midnight, I found her sleeping in our bed, turning away from me. The atmosphere was tense, and our conversation was limited to a simple exchange of good morning wishes and a request for more coffee. Within a few days, the situation began to improve and become warmer, but it was never fully resolved. It was clear Shannon loved me, but I couldn't understand why she wouldn't take my side and ask her sister to stop humiliating me. The only way out for me was to avoid Nita as much as possible, making excuses so I wouldn't be home when she came. Besides, I tried to minimize conversations about her with Shannon. The weeks leading up to my trip to West Lafayette were particularly stressful. Oddly enough, Nita was present in the house more often than ever before. Almost every day when I came home from work, she and Shannon had important conversations in the kitchen. Perhaps for this or another reason, Shannon began treating me colder and more distant. She realized it wasn't worth mentioning her sister in my presence, leaving me in the dark about what was going on with Nita. But apparently Shannon still distanced herself from me, although our communication remained polite. But who needs simple politeness with his wife? She became cautious around me, and our closeness decreased noticeably. Recently, Shannon and I have been distant from each other for several weeks, exchanging only the usual hugs. Due to the strange atmosphere, it was challenging for me to approach her, and I was on the verge of giving up. Our private relationships also became routine, with only a few occurrences in the past month, though not great at deep conversations, 
I did try once or twice. I asked Shannon if something was bothering her, if we needed to have a serious conversation. I wanted to solve our problems, but she said it was okay. She mentioned concerns about changes at work and minor issues with Nita, but nothing requiring special attention. I appreciate your concern, dear. A forced grin and a peck on the cheek, that's all I got in response. This behavior continued for quite a long time, and I decided to have a long conversation with Aunt Gwen. Aunt Gwen, my mother's younger sister, played a significant role in my upbringing after my father's pass away and my mother's subsequent illness. Although she now lives in Seattle, we often talked on the phone. If anyone could help me understand Shannon's behavior, it was undoubtedly Gwen. When I returned from Purdue, I decided to call her over the weekend. After Roland sent the photo, I made a deliberate effort to set aside the confusion and focus on my work. On Friday morning, my main goal was to test the system's capabilities, ensure it handled the load, and quickly move on. By about one o'clock in the afternoon, we had successfully completed all necessary checks. As a thank you gesture, the Purdue team invited me to a quick lunch, and then I headed home. During the 200-mile journey, my mind was filled with numerous puzzling questions. Had they already been private? Or was it just a possibility? Did my actions contribute to this situation? I also wondered if Shannon's feelings for him were genuine or just a passing fling. Could I find the strength to forgive what happened? Or was our relationship beyond repair? And did Nita play a role in this? Did she encourage her sister's actions? Maybe? Approaching Columbus in chaotic Friday traffic, I didn't have a clear answer, but I knew I wasn't ready to face her at home. After considering Roland's generous offer of his guest room, I ultimately chose a modest room at Motel 6, had a hearty steak and beer at Outback, and spent another night alone. With a sense of satisfaction, I sent Shannon the least affectionate message possible. I'm almost done, and I have to go home tomorrow. No sweet words or emojis, just the essential information for her to know I was alive. She replied, Okay, honey, I miss you. Yes, that's correct. Around 9.30 I drove back to our street, slowly past our house, checking for unfamiliar cars nearby. Nothing seemed unusual. The house was dark, except for our bedroom, where the curtains suggested the TV was on. Disappointed, I returned to Motel 6 and went to bed. When I returned to the house shortly before noon, there was no rush. I felt a wave of emptiness and indifference. If earlier I was consumed by anger and vindictive thoughts, now I longed for resolution. I needed to find out the truth, assess the consequences of this ordeal, and confront them face to face. Shannon's absence and the eerie silence in the house only intensified my emotions. Entering the house through a side door, I went upstairs to freshen up and organize my things. Then, I went down to the kitchen to make a sandwich. My gaze involuntarily shifted to the front door. I stood paralyzed. A large suitcase stood untouched at the entrance. Approaching it, I felt its weight, indicating it was full. Time seemed to slip away, and I couldn't figure out how long I'd been fixated on it. The silence was broken by the sound of a side door opening. Shannon came in, greeting me softly. Hello, baby. With an unusual half-smile, she hugged me warmly, more like a grandmother than a passionate embrace between spouses. After a week apart, I couldn't take my eyes off her. I wasn't planning to raise my voice or create a scene. I just wanted to understand the situation. She led me back to the kitchen, holding my hand, and we sat at the table across from each other. Expressing concern, she mentioned that I must be tired and asked if I had eaten. She inquired if she could cook me lunch and asked what I wanted. I reassured her, saying I was fine, and focused on her face. Leaning closer, she conveyed seriously that she needed to talk to me, expressing urgency. She apologized and watched me patiently, waiting for a response, but I remained silent. Eventually, she inquired if she could ask me something and requested that I remain calm and refrain from anger. She wanted to tell the whole story before hearing my thoughts and acknowledged that she was asking a lot. I nodded in agreement, and all I wanted was for the situation to be resolved. She took a deep breath and began talking about Nita. To my surprise, anger suddenly surged within me. I expressed my frustration, asking, What does this rude woman have to do with it? Shannon pleaded, her face filled with panic, and she begged me to listen. I noticed that my fists were tightly clenched, 
and I was holding my breath. After rising from my seat, pacing around the kitchen and settling back down, I took a deep breath, attempting to compose myself. In due course, I responded, Okay, go ahead. I promise to listen, so I will. I couldn't help but speculate on how the conversation might shift if she began discussing her sister. It hinted at the possibility of enduring a more extended discussion. After giving me a cautious glance, she began again, explaining that she had been spending a lot of time with Nita lately. She hoped I could understand how it was affecting her and creating tension. She mentioned that things had taken a turn for the worse between Alex and Nita, and she suspected him of betrayal. About a month ago, Nita found him with one of his assistants on the office table, and Shannon witnessed the unfolding scene, feeling a strong sense of sympathy for Nita. It goes without saying that it was an incredibly tough time for her. Nita experienced deep heartache and anger, unsure how to handle the situation. Alex constantly apologized, expressed a desire to reconcile, and promised to do everything possible, including seeking counseling to improve their relationship. But everything changed on Tuesday. Feeling depressed, Nita decided to take a break to calm down, and then requested Alex to leave, expressing her desire for a divorce. Unfortunately, he resorted to physical force, leading to her hospitalization. On Tuesday evening, she endured a concussion. In that moment, my own marital struggles briefly faded from my mind. I conveyed sympathy, stating, I'm sorry, Shannon. I wouldn't wish that on anyone. She lowered herself, took my hand, and conveyed gratitude, remarking, Thank you, dear. I understand that you don't like her, and that means a lot to me. Now comes the toughest part. She paused and explained that Nita would be discharged from the hospital on Monday, but had nowhere to go. Alex is acting extremely difficult and refuses to leave the house. She wanted to offer her our guest room where she can stay. Most likely she'll have to take sick leave and work part-time for a couple of weeks. She wanted to be close to her and take care of her. She hurriedly explained, I know you don't like her, and you don't want to be around her but she has no one else to turn to. Please, Ben. Her life is falling apart and I am her only sister. Shannon, you're right. She's not the kind of person I particularly enjoy being around. But it doesn't matter now. Of course, she can stay with us. Did you really think I would refuse? She got up excitedly, circled the table, and settled on my lap, wrapping her arms around me. When I looked into her eyes, pure joy radiated from her face. Expressing her gratitude, she whispered, Thank you, my love. Her lips met mine in a gentle kiss, assuring me that everything would be fine. She vowed to protect me and ensure we saw each other less often. With utmost sincerity, she promised never to let her sister belittle me again. Never again. The happiness emanating from her overwhelmed me, and I couldn't resist hugging her tighter. As I put my head on her shoulder, tears welled up for a moment, and I composed myself. Carefully, I moved her from my lap to a nearby chair. I went to the sink, poured a glass of water, unable to endure the anticipation any longer. Okay, Shannon, can we just finish this? Let's get this over with, whatever it is, I pleaded. She looked at me with confusion, and I couldn't help but express my disappointment. Honestly, you can't even be honest with me, I said. Dear, I sincerely don't understand what you're talking about. What is the rest? She asked, disappointed. I picked up my phone, scrolled through the messages until I found the photo Roland had sent me, and shoved it in her face. This, Shannon, you and this man, I said to her face. The revelation left her speechless. I was momentarily puzzled by the sight of her suitcase at the front door. How could she leave when she was helping her sister move in with us? Before I could finish, she said, Oh, Ben, this is incredibly sad. Carrie, his wife, has a recurrence of breast cancer, and their two-year-old twins are in the center of events. He is absolutely terrified, and my heart is bursting with grief. I stared at her, suddenly grasping the importance of the photo where she was with a man. Yes, we had dinner. He really needed someone to talk to. Her prognosis is uncertain right now. She held my gaze for a moment, conveying a deeper meaning. Did you genuinely believe it? Oh my God. Did you think it was a romantic dinner? That's how it appears, right? I couldn't even control the tone of my voice. Roland and Emily Bruton certainly thought so. They are ready to meet you face to face. Before I could say anything or take any action, she hugged me tightly. Benjamin Timothy Haggard, you are the only man I have loved or even considered in the last seven years. Eric is just a friend whose wife is suffering from a terminal illness. 
I offered him emotional support when he needed it. It became harder and harder for me to breathe, not just because she refused to let me go. Additionally, I couldn't help but notice tension in our environment over the past few weeks. We lacked communication. Physical closeness was scarce. I was consumed with worry about Nita, my love, and I couldn't trust you with this. The mere mention of her name disgusts you, so I carried this burden alone, which led to distance. I apologize for being so distant. My thoughts were exclusively focused on Nita and the vile actions committed against her. Okay, I guess I can understand that. But the suitcase caught my attention. It was standing, fully packed at the front door. As I looked at it, she gently pulled my head down and kissed me on the lips with a long, sincere kiss, and then met my tear-stained eyes. It was obvious that something had happened. I decided to go to Nita and Alex's house and gathered clothes so that she would have everything she needed for the coming weeks. Baby, I'm very sorry about the misunderstanding that happened. She apologized with regret in her voice. I'm very sorry about this misunderstanding, I said regretfully. You've had this photo since Thursday, and I can imagine how you suffered. My love, I'm very sorry. Without letting go of my hand, she gently pulled me towards the stairs. Her urgency left no room for delay. We had to solve something extremely important urgently. In the private atmosphere of the bedroom, we gently took off our clothes, hugged, exchanged tender kisses, and shed tears of love. We hugged each other tightly, fervently, and passionately, making tender love completely immersed in the presence of my soulmate. While lying in bed, our hands explored each other's bodies as we engaged in intermittent conversations. I asked, Really? And she responded, Yes, really. Her voice filled with affectionate tenderness and playful teasing. She continued, I really saw his wife. And did you really think that I was cheating on you? Our friends Ro and Emily had the same thought. Although I despised the fact that his wife has cancer, it made me think about the state of my own marriage. I confessed. I thought it was over. And she expressed her concerns, saying, I believe that one cheater in the family is more than enough. Poor Nita. As an epilogue to our conversation, it dawned on me. I'll be damned if it hasn't stopped completely. Nita, I must say she looked completely different which is not so surprising considering what she had recently been through. At the same time, she expressed great gratitude for being in our house and constantly praised Shannon for becoming her husband. She apologized to me countless times, admitting that she had completely misjudged me. In the end, I insisted that everything was fine and she could stop apologizing, but she still tried to help, even taking on some of the responsibilities of cooking and housework. When she began to feel better, after she managed to find a fierce and determined lawyer, she finally got the opportunity to gain some financial stability and secure a nice apartment for herself during the chaotic divorce process. Despite the circumstances, he and Shannon continued to spend time together, but it was very nice to have the house at their disposal again. It was a calm and restorative period, almost reminiscent of a second honeymoon. We both acutely realized the value of our relationship and the depth of our affection. Watching a marriage breakup turning into a destructive mess served as a visual reminder to us that we need to cherish and appreciate our own marriage. There are noticeably more smiles at home. Only four months later, we received the joyful news about the recovery of Eric's wife. Despite the fact that Eric continues to be eccentric, I am sincerely happy for their positive outcome.